discussion of his newly published debut novel, Lakewood. In her endorsement for the novel, Lillian Smith Book Award winning author Pam Durbin said, secret rooms, buried grief, the turbulence of love. The appealing young man who narrates this engaging novel encounters them all on a momentous journey through a summer in which he must face the ghosts of the past and the challenges of the present on his way to a future all his own. Conway Center Executive Director Jonathan Haupt praised Walsh's novel with this endorsement. I want what I say to be more than myself. Introspective college student Robert English commits to his TypeScript journal in a summer of self-discovery spent house-sitting for the new owners of his childhood home, the site of his sister's death 11 years prior. William Walsh's Lakewood takes us deeply into Robert's wounded psyche as he navigates the hauntings of his past and the uncertainty of the future. His tribulations in love and betrayal, immersion into great novels, and discovery of long hidden secrets impart lessons for Robert and for Walsh's readers of our capacity to understand and forgive. <coughs> Walsh has long established himself as a multifaceted Swiss Army knife of a writer, and Lakewood further distinguishes him as a masterful storyteller to be read again and again. William Walsh is the author of seven other books, including the award-winning collection of poems, Fly Fishing and Times Square. Walsh was born in Jamestown, New York, and raised in Lakewood until moving south in 1972. He and his family now live in Atlanta, where he is the director of the Reinhardt University Undergraduate Creative Writing and MFA programs. He is also the editor of James Dickey Review and a contributing essayist to Our Prince of Scribes, Writers remember Pat Conway. Please join me in welcoming William Walsh. I never feel like I can live up to that. <laughs> Try. <laughs> you know, I said that when Pam wrote an appealing young man, I'm not sure she was just talking about me. You know? <laughs> I know I can't not live up to that. Um, so, this is my debut novel, but I have written and have just about finished about four or five others. You know, I work on one novel for a month, and I put it down, and I work on another, and so they never get finished. And, uh, but I have this goal, and that is to finish them. Uh, and, and Jonathan has read one of them, which is called The Pig Rider, and it has come close to being published several times, but I didn't like the contract. Uh, look, Jonathan liked it, but he, uh, when he was at Story River, uh, he declined it. Uh, not because of the story or anything or how poorly written it might have been, but it was because he ran out of books that he could publish for that year. And so we were going to readdress that the following year. But unfortunately, you know, Pat died and then the, the, the press sort of uh, dissolved. Uh, but I had such great encouragement from Jonathan that um, I, I just said, I'm on the right track and I'm going to keep writing these novels, even if I don't finish them anytime soon. And this novel, Lakewood, took 39 years to write. Um, and, um, and the other ones have taken a long time, although I have one novel that's just about done. It's been sitting for six months until I, I'm going to go back and get one proof, more proof um, through the whole thing. Um, took about four, four and a half years, so I'm getting faster. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so uh, you know, you get encouraged with these things, and so what happened was, there was this thing called the pandemic, and it got in the way of everyone's life, and it got in the way of my life, and um, so here we are, I'm stuck at home, you know, and, and I like what my mom says, she goes, oh, what the hell, you know, you're gonna die from something. You know, just get out there in the world. And so I was, I, grew, I became a really good golfer again. I played golf all the time, and then I, I just happened to one day find the manuscript that I started writing when I was 18 years old. And it was terrible. Uh, and it may be, uh, I may actually have received a letter saying that it was the worst piece of literature ever written in America. Uh, you know, maybe in the world, I can't remember. But it was bad. 
<laughs> and it was about 1,500 pages long. I had just, I had to write out everything. And I call it the poison in the young writer that you have to just write that poison out of yourself. And I found it and I went, oh yeah, I remember this novel. And I loved uh, the main character, Robert, but I was in love with his uh, desired woman, Annie. Uh, I liked those two a lot. And I liked the plot a little bit. But what I did was I called, the, the, the original title was called The Letter Back Home. And it's, it's his, this young 18 year old's journal. And he house sits for his uh, history professor during the summer of his freshman and sophomore year. And he ends up, uh, he doesn't even know where he's going. He just, you know, gets the job at the university. You know, they're sitting in the office. He says, all right, you're hired. Just show up on, on Tuesday. And he shows up and he looks and it's his childhood home, which is this old Victorian house. It's a real house. I, I guess I should have brought a picture of it, but it's a real house. And actually, Wendell Miner used the real railing of the house. I sent him a picture uh, when he did this book. And so he house sits his childhood home, where 11 years earlier, his, his twin sister died when she fell out of the tree. And I liked that plot, I liked that whole idea. But 1,500 pages is way too much. And I started reading that, and it was just hideous. <laughs> um, somewhere in there, there was a five-page sex scene, you know. And I'm, and I'm 18 years old, right? <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> it was terrible. So I just, I just started crossing things out. I had science experiments that he was doing. Uh, as I like science, and I thought they were interesting, but nobody wants to read that stuff. It's like in uh, The Magic Mountain, you know, there's 30 pages where they discuss Freemasonry. Well, you know. No one wants that. So I took the first 40 pages and I rewrote them and I sent them to a friend of mine and I said, um, just let me know what you think of this. And so using the skill I've developed over the years, um, the knowledge, I, became, I was a better thinker, all of the stuff that goes into maturing uh, to some degree, um, I put all that into the first 40 pages and I sent it to her and she read it and about a week or two later wrote back and said, I like this. I like the two characters, I like the story, and I want to read more. That's all I needed. So during the pandemic, um, it took me about three or four months, but I, I just went through it. If, if it wasn't interesting, if it didn't catch my, my, you know, uh, uh, my ear immediately when I read it, uh, I just crossed out and said, no, 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 don't read that. And I got it down to about 150 pages. So I took about 10% of the original novel. And that's a lot, 150 pages. And then I went back through and I rewrote it with all the skill I have and all the things I teach my students in the undergraduate program. And then at Reinhardt University, we have a low residency program where we have, have students from all over the country that, that um, um, they do one-on-one -on -one mentorship with award-winning writers. And, um, and then once a year they come to our, re our, our university for a residency. All the stuff that I teach all of these students, um, I, I finally was able to put into this novel. And I did it all in about four or five months. And I rewrote it, I sent it to my friend, I said, here you go. And she read it, made some suggestions, and um, they came back and I made some more changes and I sent it off to a publisher. And in two weeks, they said, uh, we want it. And so the very first novel I ever started ends up being the first novel. And so, but what happened was, is during the first two or three weeks of rewriting the novel as the letter back home, in the original town, I had changed it. It was called Baker, Baker, New York, a made, made up little town. I just had this epiphany. I'm like, why not just make it your hometown, Lakewood? And I retitled it as Lakewood, and then it all fell together. I completely recreated what 1973 was like in this little town. I went back there for, uh, I did research. I was, there, I was there last year for the research uh, for the sequel, and which I'm working on. And I'm going back um, in July because there's bookstores and libraries that want me to come talk about it and so forth. But I recreated what it was like to live in this little town in 1973. Um, and so um, I'm gonna read four different things um, from uh, the book. They're, they're not terribly long. Um, well, 
first thing though I should say is this. While I'm even talking, if you have a question, just raise your hand because I don't want you to forget the question later on. So it's, it's not interrupting me, it's just you're, you're prompting a question and answer. Yes, ma'am. Did you say Wendell Minor did your cover? Yes. So How that, did you land uh, that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, I've been very fortunate uh, uh, with the way things have worked out. Um, many years ago, I met Pat Conroy and interviewed him for my first book, which is called Speak, Swipe, Shall Know The Interviews with Southern Writers. And um, I had interviewed James Dickey, um, uh, Olive Ann Burns, all sorts of writers. And toward the end, I mean, there were a couple of writers I really felt I didn't have the experience to interview. And Pat was one of them. But um, I knew where he lived, and he, he didn't live that far away, and so I wrote him a, a letter. And he said, uh, sure, you want to over. And so I went over to his house and met him, and then I interviewed him. And that, and he, and that interview went in um, the book. And so I had an association with, with Pat, and then from that, other people you get to meet in the world. Well, fast forward all these years, I came, I went, came down here for Pat's 70th birthday party. About that time, Jonathan and I, we were in uh, communication about my novel. And so I happened to tell Jonathan this story about Pat and me and my mom. Well, a few months later, of course, Pat died. And um, then a couple months after that, Jonathan emails me and says, that story that you told me, uh, we're doing a, a book, uh, you know, to sort of honor Pat. Would you write that up? And if you like it, we'll use it. Well, I did write it up. They did like it. They did publish it. So I was in, I'm in the scribe's book, page 108. Very, very proud of it. Um, nothing but good things have happened to me since that has happened, since it was published. I, I owe a, a, a great amount of debt to Jonathan for that. I've done many uh, uh, panel discussions with Jonathan and other writers who are in there, and I've met some of the other writers. Well, Wendell is in there, and when one of my books was coming out, Fly Fishing in Times Square, I thought, I would love for him to be one of my, one of my covers. So I wrote, I, I wrote him, I emailed him, and he said, well, send it to me. So I sent it to him, and he um, read it, and a month or two later, called me while I was driving on the road and said, I love your poems and I want to do the cover. I said, okay. And then he, has, he, then he did this cover and he said, well, send it to me. I did and he liked it and he did this cover. But he's also done the cover for the, a novel that has not yet been published and it's called The Pig Writer, which is the, the novel that Jonathan knows. And um, it's just sitting there and I'm just waiting and I don't want to wait for him. I don't want to wait for something. But anyways, one of those beautiful covers and you know, he every once in a while he'll call me on the phone and just talk. You know, he's a nice guy. He's very approachable. Um, but before you know that, before you have a, an introduction to someone like that, you think it is unattainable that, that they would even talk to you. And that's how I felt it was, would be with Pat, which is one of the reasons I never wrote to him, because you know, there's all these writers, and then there's Pat Conroy, and so. Uh, but he did, and and so I interviewed him, and then all these great things have happened. And so I owe a great debt to Pat because he keeps paying it forward. Uh, Jonathan has done a lot for me, and it, it, it pays forward, which is why I tell my students, I'm always paying it forward. You need to always pay it forward. You, you know, there are people who are behind you who have helped you, and you have to help the next generation. So anyways, that's how nice that story. happened. Well, thank you. So, this, so what happens is Robert's sister dies when they're nine years old. It'll be 1962, August 5th. And they stay in the little town. Oh, she falls out of the, tr the treehouse. And they stay in the little town for a couple of months. But the, uh, his mother and father can't bear to be there anymore. It's just too painful. So they um, sell everything in the house. And they, they move to Stone Mountain, Georgia, which is where Robert ends up living um, the next year. 11 years. Um, he is going to go to the University of Georgia and study medicine. He wants to be a doctor. But on graduation night, his girlfriend Ashley, uh, there's a big party and they go to it, and Ashley and he are in the pool house kind of making out. And she wants to, they, they've never had intercourse. 
and tonight's the night she has decided. But they don't have any protection, and so he says, we can't. And he's worried about her getting pregnant. Not that he doesn't want to, but he says, no, I can't. Well, anyway, what happens is they go their own way that night, and he goes home, and come to find out she went over to his best friend's house. And Will Prune slept with his girlfriend, and that was the end of him wanting to stay around Georgia. So he decides, I'm either going to go to Clemson or Chautauqua University. Clemson, of course, is a real place. Chautauqua University I made up. So um, he heads off and he goes back to his hometown, and then um, then the, you know he goes through all his classes, and now it's the summer, and he has um, he starts his journal. He wants to write a novel, and so he but he starts this journal called the Summer Journal of Robert English by Robert English, 1973, Monday, May 14th. I'm house sitting for my history professor, Dr. Lawless and his wife, Emily. He said his name is Irish and is pronounced lawless, which was the first thing he told my class on day one of World History One. It's a few minutes after 9 a.m. They left an hour ago for Buffalo for a connecting flight to New York City, and then they'll be on to Dublin to spend the summer with Emily's sister, Jillian. I'm house sitting, oh, by the way, Jillian, a friend of mine, she's a movie star in Hollywood, and they write movie scripts and everything, and her real name is Jillian. <laughs> And I couldn't talk to her in high school because she was so beautiful. So I put her, I put her in my mind. I hope she might be watching. Who knows? Oh, goodness. Anyway. I'm house sitting the entire summer until a week before the fall semester begins. I'm on sabbatical in the fall, so we might not ever return, Dr. Lawless joked before they left. He told me to be prepared in the event they stayed in Ireland through Christmas. Be prepared. He obviously doesn't know that I'm an Eagle Scout, Troop 370. He's writing a book about Ireland's neutrality during World War II and Hitler's plan to invade Ireland had the war continued. In class one day, he talked about this for an entire hour. If Hitler had invaded Ireland, it would have been a huge mistake, he told the class, because the Irish are fierce warriors. They've been a pain in the Brits' ass for over a thousand years. Do you think he'd allow... Do you think they'd allow Hitler to just roll through like he did in Poland? In his kitchen, Dr. Lawless said he has, a ton, he has a ton of research to do and pictures to take with his new camera, a Pentax ES. See here? ES stands for easy as shit. He showed me the camera, which was a marvel of technology. He also bought a tripod. I'll be taking a lot of photos if I have these prepaid mailers, so all I have to do is toss them in the mail, then, when they're developed, they'll be mailed to my house. When they arrive, just pile them on the shelf. I'll look at them when we get back. Terrace Avenue. This was my childhood home before Kimberly died. Once Emily and Dr. Lawless left, I walked the halls of my old house to explore, opening every door, but I felt sacrilegious, as if this place is one of the great pyramids loaded with treasures and guarded by evil curses. Snooping is breaking a moral contract. I felt as if I was an intruder. Are you coming home for the summer, my mom asked, the last time we spoke a few weeks ago? I'm not sure. Your father and I want to go on vacation to Yellowstone. I'll probably be working as an intern for a professor to earn extra credit, I lied. If I had mentioned the old house, she and my father would have had a conniption fit and been up here before I could have hung up the phone. They didn't want me even applying to Chautauqua University, let alone attending it. Lakewood is the past. When we moved away, my parents buried our lives there to such a depth no one could ever return. After time, after time has elapsed, you don't know where to dig, and if you do, you'll only find heartbreak. The lawless's furniture and decorations are dark and ornate, which is much different from what we what we had when I li we lived here. My parents had secondhand furniture that people had given them or things that they bought at flea markets and garage sales. They cleaned it up and restored most of it. In September 1962, my parents had a huge garage sale and I sat on the porch overlooking the lake with paper and pencil trying to catalog everything being sold, but the sheer volume was overwhelming. Plus, no one came over to my card table to talk to me. 
I was upset at first, but my parents assured me that they would buy new furniture in Atlanta. A lot of it was stuff that came to the house when my folks bought it. Of course, to me, it was just our stuff, since it was there when I was born. But they let it all go, sold everything that wasn't tied down. My parents did not sell my things, nor my sisters. Kimberly's stuff is still packed away in cardboard boxes in the attic of our Stone Mountain house. So that scene where he's at the little card table, that was one of the very first scenes I ever wrote when I was 18 for this book. Um, I mean, it's better written now than it was then, but that, that was one of the first scenes. Um, so he has this summer adventure, and he says early on that he wants to write a novel. Well, he really has two things he wants to do. He wants to write a novel, and he wants to get laid. And he says, I want to get laid, because it didn't happen this year in college. And so he ends up getting more than he bargains for, okay? Um, because he soon, find, he soon finds out that there are other women, and that some of them are interested in him. So he goes through the summer um, not writing the novel, because he doesn't want to do the research, but he writes um, uh, the journal, which is sort of a letter to the house in a way, as you'll, you'll see at the end. Um, so, um, let's see. Oh, okay, so this is the introduction. So he ends up meeting, um, so the, the lawlesses have a son named Stephen, and Stephen drowned five or six years before the story begins. And the main character, uh, Robert, meets a woman named Annie. She's 25, 26. Well, she was Stephen's girlfriend from like third or fourth grade. They, they knew each other, dated in high school, dated in college, were planning on getting married, but he drowns at the lake. And um, his friend Mike tries to save him, but Mike ends up getting almost drowned and he ends up, he lives, but he has some uh, uh, problems mentally. He can't function the way he used to. Uh, so it's all interconnected. And so now Robert is in the house at the same age Stephen was when he died. And now Annie sees him living in the house. Of course, it's a house that she had been to hundreds and hundreds of times because that's where her boyfriend lived. And so they have met, and now it is July 4th, and they're going to go with Mike, and they're gonna go watch the fireworks at the lake. And this has already happened because it's late and he's, he's writing about what happened. It's 4 a.m. as I type this and I'm exhausted. I have to be up for work in two hours and uh, 30 minutes. I stayed out most of the night. I had a hangover, not from drinking because I did not drink, but from no sleep. While I was cleaning up the grill and putting stuff away, Annie rode up in an old mobile convertible which she borrowed from her dad. She and I and Mike rode to the beach at Long Point to watch fireworks. We had a blanket, a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, wine and soda. We just happened to sit next to Roy, his wife Louise, and his daughters Becky and Karen, who I met a week or so ago at the office. They let Annie borrow their corkscrew. She drank all the wine. I had a coat. So Roy is the, the, the guy who runs the business where Robert got a job. After the fireworks, Annie, Mike, Karen, who by then we had managed to become friends with, and I drove around the lake in Annie's convertible. I drove because Annie could not hardly walk straight, and Karen sat scrunched next to me, between me and Annie, which is a mouthful, by the way. Mike sat in the back. Karen's mom said she had to be home by 1 a.m. I drove everyone around while Karen and Annie navigated, telling me where to turn. I drove through Lima's Point, past the Lenhart Hotel, and ended up at Midway Park, where we parked the car along the lake. We sat in the car eating ice cream and watched the lights across the lake. We walked around the amusement park, but didn't ride anything. My father knows the owner, Red Walsh, and he said, and that's the guy's real name uh, who really owns that. My dad said they're going to build a bridge connecting Bemis with Stowe because, Karen told us, in the winter, the ferry doesn't run and people have to drive around the lake. It might spoil the look, Annie said. After an hour, we drove around the other side of the lake to DeWittville, to around Mayville, before heading over to Bear Mountain. We parked on a dirt, dirt drive on Mike's property. Annie turned the heater on, and we, we leaned the seats completely back 
stared at the stars and listened to an eight-track tape of Carol King's tapestry. When the music had played through once, we drove Mike home first, then Karen. I might stop by the office to say hi, Karen said. At my house, I asked Annie to have a cup of tea with me on the porch. We took the dogs outside, and while we were standing in the yard, she kissed me. I did not really kiss her back because I thought it was a mistake. I thought she was going to kiss me on the cheek, but missed, and, and hit my lips instead. Once I realized she was really kissing me, I sort of tried to kiss her, but then the kiss was over. It was clumsy and awkward, which was my fault. She only kissed me once, and now I wonder if she will kiss me again, since I really, really didn't try to kiss her back. I feel like such an idiot. What would Sean Connery do? He'd drive over to her house, knock on her door, maybe break it down, take her in his arms and kiss her, and then leave without saying more than, excuse me, Lord, have you seen my cat? There's something to be said for being Scottish. <laughs> it's 5.15 a.m. So he falls head over heels in love with her, but she's a little bit older. <laughs> Karen's a little bit younger. So, um, so what really happens is in, in, in fiction a lot, and if you know the novel by Flannery O'Connor called Wise Blood, there's a character called Sabbath Lily Hawks. And she's the daughter of this uh, preacher who is of Charlottesville. Uh, her job is to prevent Hazelmost, the main character, from achieving his happiness. And she's always trying to seduce him. And it veers him off course in what he really wants to do, which is to start uh, the Church of Christ uh, without Christ, I think is what it's called. I'm look up the exact name of it. So Karen's role, she's 16, and he's 26. Her role is to uh, prevent Robert from achieving his happiness. And his happiness is seemingly with Annie. He has fallen in love with her. Annie has fallen in love with him, even though he may be sort of the surrogate of Stephen, who died years ago. So uh, this is one of those sort of incidences where um, Karen started to get uh, wedged between the two of them. Thursday, July 19th. Karen came by this evening while I was mowing the lawn. She rode her bicycle to the, ch uh, to the house. She didn't say much, just giggled a lot while sitting on the front porch. Strange days indeed. She's pretty though. I don't have a light on my bike, and if Buck Klein catches me again, he'll give me a ticket. Who's that, I ask? Officer Klein. He's the deputy around here. He's a nice guy, but he'll write you up if he's warned you before. He stopped me last week for no light. I'll drive you home. I'll put your bike in the back of the truck. We don't have to go home immediately. We can drive around or go get ice cream or do something. Let's. Let's go to the Hotel Lenhart and sit on the porch and watch, watch the boats come in. Yuck. That's where my parents always go. How about Mayville? There's a bar in the Hotel St. Elmo. I did not want to go to a bar and get a drink, not after eight beers last night. We drove to the Tasty Freeze on Foot Avenue, got our ice cream, then went to Allen Park and sat at a picnic table. I want some action, she said. Let's go to Mayville. And then there's a section break, and he writes, tired, I'll write later. So now he writes in the next day. Friday, July 20th. Nothing happened last night with Karen. I wanted to sit on the porch at the Hotel Lenhart and have ice cream, but she had wilder ideas. Allen Park and ice cream cones just weren't enough excitement for her. She convinced me that the Hotel St. Elmo in Mayville was the happening place. I had only one beer. She had three drinks. A cosmopolitan, a glass of red wine, and a 16-ounce Schlitz. It was a slow night. Yeah, you never mix the that. There, it was a slow night. There were only three other people in the bar, and the bartender didn't ask Karen for her ID. While driving around the lake, she said, let's go to Midway. I got a pee. So I drove to Midway Amusement Park. Mostly we played skee ball, but then she wanted to ride the twirl world. We did. And about two minutes after, she said, I don't feel good. Yeah. <laughs> and about 30 seconds later, Karen threw up in the bushes. She barfed two more times before I had her in the truck. We drove around with the windows down, but she did not barf anymore. 
can I go back to your house and clean up before I go home? She was cleaning up, and, and I was sitting outside the bathroom talking to her. When she turned and threw up in the toilet, she cleaned up again, and I took her home. I hope that was enough excitement for her, because it was for me. Mowing the yard, Tasty Freeze, Allen Park, St. Elmo Hotel, Midway Park, driving around a drunk girl. By the time I took her home, she was no longer sick. She might have still been drunk, but Roy can't get angry with me. I offered her a quiet evening, but she chose the twirl alone. <laughs> That's one of my favorite scenes. Because you don't mix alcohol, especially when you're 16, but she doesn't know that. Um, so really what happens is throughout the entire summer, he, what he's really doing is he's just documenting all the things that happened to him. And he thinks it's sort of seemingly uh, uninteresting, but when you start putting them together, all the little nuances, uh, it just develops into this plot of, of these characters and what they're doing in their life. And the, one of the joys about this for me was I fell in love with all the characters while writing them. And I did an interview last week for two hours for a magazine, and they asked me about how hard it was to do the journal. Well, it's, it's the way I started the book all those years ago. But I found now that as, you know, I'm a tad bit older than 18 when I started, but I really was able to get into the character every day that I sat down to write and get into his voice um, as that 18-year-old character. And it just, it's one of those things where I just sort of knew who this character was. Now, I also told him that I'm experiencing something that Pat talked about one time with me, and I... And that is because he writes in first person that everyone thinks that those character, the main character in Pat's book is Pat. And, and it's not. It's based on him a little bit. But he said, it, you know, people come up to him and say, wow, that must have been really terrible. <laughs> what happened? And uh, I've had that happen a little bit. My uh, next door neighbor, she was uh, really nice. She caught me in the driveway a couple weeks ago. And she said, um, I'm about halfway done with your book, and I bought it just to be polite. <laughs> but she says, but I gotta tell you, it's changing my life. I love it. And then she says, I have to ask you, is Kimberly real? And I think she, and she started talking about that she feels as though the main character, Robert, is really me. And some other people have asked me about this. And, and it's not, there are some things that he has my sensibilities and so forth, um, but um, I am not him and he is not me. Uh, because he can be a scoundrel sometimes. Um, but, but that's always good. If you think about Dago and um, Othello, you know, be wise, get thee home. Well, he's conspiring to destroy uh, Othello's you know, world. And so he's, he's very uh, devious. And there's a little bit of Machiavellian in, in this to some degree. Um, so what was the next scene I was going to write? Um, oh, so what happened here is um, in the town that I grew up in, Jamestown, New York, and you have Jamestown, and then it butts right up to Celeron, and then that, it was like a mile long, and then Lakewood is a couple miles long, and it's right next door. Lakewood and Celeron, um, being that close together, you know, everybody knows each other um, for the most part, I think. Lucille Ball is from Celeron. If you ever, you know, there's the Lucille Ball Comedy Center in Jamestown. She's really from Celeron, and her house is there, and you can visit it. She and my grandmother grew up together and were friends. And so, um, when I was a kid, the editor of the Georgia Review, um, who just retired uh, a year or two ago, his name was Stephen Corey. Stephen lived four blocks from me, but he's 11 years older, so I didn't know him. And we are, you know, our age difference was just so much. And, but we met and became friends um, uh, over the years. Um, he, he knew my cousins who were older. Anyways, he lived just um, yeah, about four blocks away. So while I was writing this, um, I have a section here where Annie takes Robert to a poetry reading. And he doesn't really want to go to a poetry reading. And so what I did was I put Stephen Corey in my book. And, and so I wrote to Stephen. I said, you're going to be in my book, my novel. And of course, he writes back like, oh, Lord, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? 
I said, now send me some poems that you wrote in and around 1970 through about 73. And so Stephen found them, and a couple days later, he had scanned them and sent me some. And so um, I, I, I put him in this scene. And now the whole scene here, um, the reason I have him go into the poetry reading is because, as we know in our lives, in our relationships with those people that we love, we don't, also, we don't always go to things and do things that we want to do. We do things oftentimes because the other person in that relationship wants to do them, and we go along. And this is what he's doing here with Amy, um, because he is head over heels in love with her. Um, Wednesday, August 8th. Art is I, science is we. So said Claude Bernard sometime between 1813 and 1878. I just read this in an almanac. At lunch, I met Annie at the park and we sat on a bench. Afterwards, we walked to the quality market for ice cream sandwiches. Mike was working in the park, parking lot, carrying groceries up to a woman's car. He tried to say hello to us while loading the groceries into the woman's four gallons. As we were looking for ice cream, we found this in the store. That lady only gave me 15 cents. That's not worth pushing the air out of her way. This didn't sound like Mike, but more like something the other kids might say. Tonight, Annie dragged me to a poetry <coughs> reading at Jamestown Community College, which is the first community college in the country. I only went because she asked. I would not do this for any other woman. Not a shot in hell. However, I actually had a good time. Annie and I sat with a woman named Marlene who was older and years ago was Annie's fourth grade teacher. Annie hadn't seen her in more than 10 years. Marlene was there because the poet Stephen Corey was her student many years ago, sometime in the late 50s, I think. I'm sitting way back here, Marlene said, because I don't want Stevie to see me. I don't want him getting nervous. I'm nervous for him. He was always one of my best students, and now look at him. He's a poet, too. And, and by the way, Marlene really was Stephen's fourth grade teacher. Mm -hmm. I did my research. And, uh, this was the first time for me, and I enjoyed some of what this guy had to say. At one point, I grabbed a napkin and wrote down a few lines that were particularly poignant. He read a poem that worried me for my first lover and her mother. I think I understood it which is what was unnerving. It was about going to the hospital with his lover to visit her mother who was dying of cancer. Even though Annie and I are not lovers, I am in love with her and sort of think I could love her for the rest of my life. I imagine myself and Annie in a similar situation like the poem. I understand there would be so much pain for her if she had to visit her mother in the hospital. I would never want that for her. I remember one line from this, this poem, growing undone, undoes what we are. Somehow that also made me sad because maybe we grow up and stop being kids or fun or curious. It made me want to hold Annie and tell her I will always be here for her. I wonder if the lover he talked about is his wife now. I wrote down on my napkin as best I could remember a phrase from a few of his poems but I only remember one of the title. And these are the, the pieces I remember. <clears throat> you thought it was breeze through the window. It was her hair grazing my face. Once again, I am the poet of emptiness. Ropes can pull us to places different from those we have known. And then from divorce. I don't know how to leave, which woman to clutch as I turn, which wrong choice to make once more. I don't know how to write poetry, but I always enjoyed when my mother read it to me and Kimberly. I enjoyed this guy's stuff, and he was somewhat funny. There was another poet who read, a guy from some town near Chicago. I cracked a joke to Annie about his black turtleneck and beatnik mustache and goatee. She laughed, but then told me to be quiet. I'm serious. I am serious. I'm serious that he really loves his car way too much. All his poems are about cars and telephone poles. I don't get what he's all about, do you? No, but we're here for the experience. Well, here's my opinion. Mr. Goatee wearing beatnik was too full of himself. I swear the greatest admiration came from his own love of himself. 
This Corey guy was pretty good. He even dedicated a poem to his wife, who I think was sitting in the front row. That was nice of him, and it made me think I could dedicate a painting to Annie, Robert's painting during the summer. I liked Marlene too. She was super nice, and for being older, she was beautiful. This night reminded me of a movie where everyone at the art gallery is hip and ends up drinking gallons of wine, talking about intellectual ideas from Proust to Sartre to Joseph Campbell, and then everyone sleeps with someone they didn't know before they arrived, or even after they left. None of that happened, of course. Before heading home, Annie and I stopped for ice cream cones at the Tasty Freeze in Foot Avenue. She had strawberry. I had a vanilla dip. I'm not sure what everyone else did after the poetry reading, but I kissed Annie. On the way home, she had eaten a cherry-flavored Jolly Rancher. Then she kissed me at her front door. Her lips and tongue tasted like cherry. Quite incredible. If you've never done that, <laughs> just a tip. <laughs> Great dessert, though, but watermelon and cherry. How are we on time, Jonathan? Doing great. We're at uh, 640, you have 20 minutes. Oh, fantastic. Any questions there by anybody? I love questions. Well, so one of the things that has happened is with this interview I did the other day for two hours, the questions were quite in depth and it made me think about how everything works and the relationships and the metaphors that run through the novel. Um, and so um, it, it makes me have to do a, an analysis of what I wrote. Because before I didn't, I, just, I wrote it and, and, I, and I knew what I was doing, of course. But, and, but we have to really start and think about things. And what is the relationship to this, to this, to this? Well, one of the things that happens in the story is that um, because Stephen is dead, and he's, you know, and every, and, but there are things in the house that are his, there's a pinball machine. But it's not a regular pinball machine. It's a baseball pinball machine they made in the early 60s. And uh, you hit the button and the ball comes out and then you hit the flipper and it hits and it, you hit a, get a base hit, a double, triple. And if you get up the ramp, it goes in as a home run. And so Mike, who was Steven's friend, comes over all the time. Uninvited, just it's like he's a, you know, an attachment to the house. Uh, but he becomes Robert's best friend. And they play games all the time. And one of the games they're always playing uh, is, is this pinball baseball. But the, the undercurrent, sort of one of the um, uh, sub arcs of the story, is all the games that are played. There's baseball, pinball, there's um, card games like cribbage and crazy eights, uh, there's chess, uh, there is uh, aggravation, there's the game of love. Seduction, all those things that are being played. So all these games are being uh, played through the story. Um, so um, I don't have a section where I'm going to read about the, about the games, but uh, I just thought I'd mention it for whatever reason. Um, Bill, I have a question. Oh yes. On, um, when you were talking about Stephen Curry kind of being inserted in your book and you know, different names that have a meaning for you, I did that in, in my novel and. You know, I was fascinated with some high school friends' names. So let's get up here out, rise and fly. Um, and sometimes there's a little bit more than just names. There's cars that are meaningful and things like that. Mm -hmm. I've heard the term Easter egg. Is that an adequate description of what I'm doing as I do that? Well, um, I, I've heard that term. I call them plants. You're planting things in there. So if you look at um, um, Flannery O'Connor, I'll just bring her up. Or, if you look at her story, um, uh, Good Country People, where you have the Bible salesman, okay? Um, the, her, the, the main character's name is Joy, but she goes and gets a PhD in philosophy, and, and then she's miserable, and <laughs> she changes her name to Holga, which is like, you know. So, she, she, so names mean a lot to her. Um, what the, her mother is Mrs. Hopewell, and one woman, uh, her name is Mrs. Freeman. So those things are very important for the metaphor or for the symbolism of novels and short stories. Um, the Bible salesman is based off a real person. His name in the story is Manly Pointer. So that's, you know, yeah, Manly Pointer. And so, um, but those things, 
you know, you plant these things in there and if you layer them enough, they become uh, relevant. And I did this in, in some places here, um, but I actually put some real people in my book and, and I got permission. Uh, one of the sad stories was when I finished the book, there's a man named Tony Barone. Uh, Mr. Barone was the town pharmacist. And I would go up to the pharmacy and, and that's where I'd buy my baseball cards. And so when Robert goes to the pharmacy, he buys baseball cards and Tony said, well, you must like baseball. And they start talking baseball a little bit. Well, Mr. Barone, you know, he went to um, Notre Dame and he played baseball. So I put, I put him in my story and I got permission. Well, I finished the book and I didn't get to write it and three days later he died. So uh, my mom knew him, my mom knew his wife, Elaine. Um, I, I played with their, their kids when I was a kid because we were all the same age. So I wrote them and said, here's what I've done and he's in the book. And I, so I got permission from them. They signed a, a waiver and then there are some other people. Uh, I put in the story, my grandfather's in the book. Now it doesn't say, this is Bill's grandfather, but uh, those who know him, uh, my brothers, my cousins, and my mom, and so forth, will recognize him. Um, my mom and dad are in the book, one small little scene. And so I told my mom, one, one of them, well, where am I? I said, you'll have to find yourself in there. <laughs> my, and my two brothers and myself, we're in, we're in the book in one scene. But it doesn't say our names or anything. So I, I did that throughout. And, and I was paying homage to these people. Um, and so there were some people who I put in the story who knew they were gonna be in the story and then I sent them the waivers and I could never get the waivers from them. And so, you know, we had to turn this over pretty quickly. So I, I had to change their names a little bit and because I couldn't use their likeness. But I did that throughout the story somewhat um, in here. Um, Other section I wanted to uh, read. One second here. So Robert. Um, oh, so what happens is Robert ends up. Um, there's a, a young girl in the, at the college named Caroline. She's a bitter pill, um, and and but he likes her. She's beautiful. He's attracted to her, um, but she's you know he calls her the ice queen sometimes because she's just a she's not a nice person and. and but he, th he thinks, well, maybe if she gets to know me, she'll like me. Well, she misses her final exam, but then comes back to take it in biology. And, you know, Robert got an A in that. So he says, look, I will, um, I will quiz you for what's going to be on the exam. And so they, they, they have something to eat at the house, and he quizzes her. And they're talking, and um, he says, well, look, let's go for a ride in, in uh, Dr. Lawless's Corvette. He's got a 61 Corvette. And so they go for a ride, and lo and behold, he ends up wrecking the Corvette because she hits him in the jaw and then he wrecks the car. But anyways, he has to get the car fixed. And in order to do that, he has to get a job. And so that's how he ends up getting a job working for Roy um, uh, at this company called Chautauqua Indoor Advertising. And his job is he gets to read books and he does an analysis of books and magazine articles and all these different things for he does it for uh, the advertising uh, world back in the day. It was slower than it is now. Things, they turn things around now in a couple of hours. Back then, they would read everything, write up these reports, and then um, three to six months later, you'd see advertisements. You know, they get them out quickly now. But back in the day, before the internet, things were slower. So he, he gets to do this, and he gets to read these stories, which um, is interesting in here because of what you know what they really mean, but. It, in book two, it's going to mean a lot because in the end of the novel, uh, Annie and Robert um, have a falling out. And uh, it's because Robert gets caught with Karen. And Annie feels betrayed because she gets to a point where she, she hasn't been able to love anybody. She hasn't been able to get over Stephen's death. And she's dated men, but she hasn't been able to go beyond just going on a couple dates and things of that nature. But she finally gets to the point with Robert that she can. In a way, she's sort of dating the Stephen of six years ago. It's really not that healthy. Uh, but she doesn't know this, of course. So anyways, she catches Robert and Karen together. And then they, they, go to, they have a falling out. She runs off. 
and he says, fine, I'm going. And he quotes the song by Jim Croce, if that's the way that you want it, that's the way I want it more. <laughs> none, of us, none of us have ever said that, have we? But he says that, and he goes, says, all right, I'm leaving, I'm going to Paris. And so the book ends with Robert going to Paris. <clears throat> and Roy says, well, if you go there, I'll give you a recommendation, go to Shakespeare and Company, and you can get a job, because you're very well read. And so that's what he does in book two. Um, and in book two, he goes there, and his parents come visit him for Christmas. And they realize he's not making enough money. Paris is too expensive. And so um, they said, look, why don't you think about a different city? And his father recommends Dublin. And he said, why don't you go to Dublin? It's a lot less expensive. And you can apply and go to Trinity College, which is what he does in book two. And while he's there, he meets a young girl his same age who is from Savannah, Georgia. And they start dating uh, while they're there, and then they fall in love. And, uh, but Annie runs off and doesn't tell anybody where she is. And so she's supposed to start her PhD to be a psychiatrist. She leaves. She calls home every so often to say, I'm not dead. But she won't tell anybody where she is for three years. And she returns. And that's how book two starts. So I have a question yes. for you, Bill. Um, over what period of time are we talking about from the time he starts the book at 18 to the time that this book ends? What's the period? It's from time? May to the beginning of September. So it's oh, about four, months. three or four months. It's just the summer. Okay. And then he runs off to Paris. And uh, But book two starts 20 years later. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And um, so... Um, they asked me the other day about um, the character, uh, Robert, what does he find out? What does he learn? What is the truth that he learns? And I said, well, we're always searching for truth. With O'Connor, Thunder O'Connor always, the most important thing was the redemption of one's soul, salvation. And I said, that's important here too, that Robert is redeemed uh, and finds salvation. And of course they pointed out, yeah, but that doesn't really happen. And I said, no, it really depends on the definition of redemption and salvation. But um, you, it doesn't always appear immediately in people's lives. And something happens while Robert is uh, in uh, Dublin, uh, and he doesn't learn about this until 20 years later. And I'm not going to tell you what that is. Yes, ma'am. Am I free to anybody here? Yeah. Um, what do you remember about being 18 and starting this? I mean, where were you in your life? Um, How could you write that many words? <laughs> yeah, no. well, um, I, I left Lakewood in 1972. Um, we moved to Dallas, Texas. And because I call it the land of high taxes and no jobs in Lakewood. It's really, if you have a lot of money, it's a wonderful place to live. If you don't have any money, it's tough. So my dad couldn't really, he didn't have really much of a job, so uh, there was an opening with a, a company in Dallas, Texas, and so we took it and we moved. We went back in uh, 73 for, I was there for the summer. Um, but then we moved a lot. I mean, I was in Dallas less than two years, Chicago 14 months, Atlanta nine months, Kentucky five, Memphis two years, Tampa one year, back to Atlanta, and then I said to my parents, I'm going to college because I, I was done with, and I was ready for school. And, and so what I remember is hopscotching the country. Um, I, I didn't like reading fiction. Um, I had a teacher, uh, 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 Miss McGuffey, in Memphis, or Mississippi, really. And I had to read um, a, a piece of fiction for her class, senior English. And I said, oh, I don't like English. I, don't, I mean, I don't like uh, fiction. I, I'll, do, I'll read biographies, because I was always reading biographies, the newspapers, everything. So now read this book. Read this book by John Steinbeck, Tortilla Flat. You'll, I think you'll like it. And I looked at it, and I was like, this big. I'm thinking, that's the size I want. That is small. <laughs> so I read it, and I got hooked. I said, I love this. This is wonderful. And I've actually gone through and read everything Steinbeck has written, except one of his books. Anyone want to guess which one that is? No, no, not this. 
But they won. Oh, grapes of wrath. Grapes of wrath. Uh, oh. But I read everything else. I got burned down on But I loved his work. So the interesting thing was, six years prior to that, she had another student in a similar situation. He did not like reading fiction. So she said, read this book. And it was Tertilla Flat. And that guy happened to be named John Grisham. <laughs> so she's very proud of the two. Yeah. <laughs> she's quite wonderful. And, and uh, so, anyways, at 18, I just hopscotched all over. And, you know, I had friends here, but all my friends were all, I was always yanked away from them. So there was this great sense of being alone all the time, which, if you look at the you know, inner workings of the story, he's worried about be, being left alone without his parents because uh, the sister's gone. And he says that, you know, there won't be anyone at Christmas. And so there was always that sense of um, solitariness, isolation. Um, though I had I made friends, but there was just that sense. And that's one of the things I always remember. And this might have been written out of that. Um, but I had, I had started writing poetry uh, in the seventh grade. And then I wrote some more uh, in high school. Um, but I thought, I'd like to write movies. That'd be nice. And then I said, I'd like to write a novel. I didn't know how to write a novel. I just said, yeah, it looks pretty easy. These guys did it, you know. Hemingway looked huh. easy, you know. Steinbeck looked easy. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of my, one of my favorite books was The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. Mm -hmm. And she was, Susan Hinton, uh, she was 15 when she started that book. And the day she graduated from high school, she was 17, she signed her contract. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, you know, good, right? yeah, anybody really can do this. <laughs> so I sat down and do it. And I didn't even know how to construct the story to, you know, have the plot. I mean, I just wrote, I just wrote, wrote. That's why I had 1,500 pages of science experiments, everything this guy was doing. And any, and I got any kind of idea, I'd sit down and write, yeah, this is what Robert would do, boom, 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 boom. And I would just write and write and write. So that's, that, that's really where it came out of, I think. Um, but when I was 18 years old, um, it was just that sense of, being isolated, but it was more than just isolation from people. It was an internal isolation that, um, because my childhood was just scattered everywhere, and I pull uh, all over that childhood and, and take things that happen and take places and put it in here. In fact, the house in the book isn't even in Lakewood. Uh, it's in a town about forty-five miles away, and friends of ours owned it. This house, this old, beautiful Victorian house. When I was a kid, they owned it. It was built in 1860, and they had restored it. Um, but we, we grew up, and I've probably been in that house a couple hundred times. I, I mean, I lived in that house for a month uh, before we moved to uh, Dallas. And, um, and it was a scary house because it was so big and dark and ornate with the wood. And oh, I wouldn't even go in the basement or the attic. It was just, it was a frightening place. And um, if, if if I was in one part of the house, I'd run to the other part that's where my parents were. Because if you walked, you know, the vampires could get you or the goblins could get you. Uh, but in the story, the, 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 not, the, uh, the house is actually a character. It is, it's not a ghost story and it's not ghoulish. It's not like the house of fall, the house of the usher or anything. Um, it's just a nice old house. But it's a, it's a historical um, museum almost. Everything from Ch uh, Robert's childhood is in that house. He goes back to rediscover his childhood, who he is, um, and, uh, uh, and his sister. I mean, his sister wrote in crayon under the, under the stairs her name and the date, and he just finds these little nuances about the house. So it is really, um, I mean, it's, it is the time capsule of what it is, the house, holding everything that he needs to find out, out about his childhood again. Um, and in, in, in the process, he falls in love with Anna. Uh, makes a big mistake with her. Um, but, uh, um, you know, let's see, I thought you were going to tell me something. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say, oh no, <laughs> not say that. So, and I've written it, and I wrote it in third person, but I have um, come back to it, and I'm starting it out in first person. Which is why I mentioned the fact that Pat used to have people think that he was the main character. Um, so Robert will be first person talking about these things. And flashbacks to things that happened in his life uh, for those 20 years. Um, uh, so, 
And but here's what happened last year. I was like researching it, and um, I found more material for the third book. I didn't even know I was going to write a third mm -hmm. book. And something historically that I found in our in the sort of family archives, something that happened to one of my cousins. I thought, wow, that'd be a great third book. And as I was just researching and researching, it, it became apparent that about. 70% of what I researched last year is for the third book, and so uh, I'm going back to do some research on the second book, but it's written. I just have to rewrite it in uh, first person. Yes? Do you have titles for the second and third books, or is it going to be labeled one, two? No, I don't have a title for the third one. My um, uh, working title is called, what was it? <laughs> oh, All Truth Be Murdered. Or all truth be murdered. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's actually it from the Bible. Mm -hmm. all, yeah, all truth be murdered. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where it's from. Um, I have another novel I wrote, which is called The Beginning of Songs. And it's, it's a completely different novel. Oh, it's the sequel to the paper. I'm, damn, you know, I got to get that published. But, and, that's from, and that's from the Bible, all um, the beginning of sorrows. So, but um, yeah, so uh, let me read one more section. We still okay on time? You're right at seven, so oh. this will be it. This okay, the big finish. <laughs> uh oh. Let's see. Oh, okay. So, um, well. Isn't it? Sorry. Okay. Um, don't know that that's not. I want to put the preface on. Oh, yes, this is the section I was going to read. So, in one of the reviews, the very first review that came out, um, the, the guy called it a stunning success, one of the uh, big surprises of the year. And so he, he actually quotes this little passage from. Um, in his review. Thursday, May 24th. The sun rose up this morning to an isochromatic canvas of apricots and peaches painted in one slow, firm stroke. A solitary motion glowed over the hills and broke the tops of the trees. The air warmed up today, and honeysuckle floated through the air. I smelled pine trees, too. I walked the dogs to the park across the street, then along the lake. There were a, small, there were a number of small boats out early, with people's fishing poles cat lot with people's fishing lines cast outward with hope. In the afternoon, while sitting on the porch, I heard the ping of a basketball dribbled in the park. I walked over and there was a man there dribbling and shooting hoops, Eric Storm Tennis. I remembered him from a few Eagles basketball games this past winter. And when I mentioned it to him, he laughed and said, No one remembers the basketball refs. We played several games of horse in 21, and though I came close, I lost every game. The best I did was 28-26. He lives down the street and played a minor league baseball for four years. I couldn't hit. It's, it's that plain and simple. I was a good defensive player. I just couldn't hit big league pitching. I played with Dick Stigman, who went on to pitch for, for Minnesota for a few years. Mm. So thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? <coughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody coming tonight. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm going to sign books. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, we're in opposite path.